Today's sermon is, you are what you repeat and keep. You are what you repeat and keep. I was working out Wednesday morning, it was the 23rd anniversary of the September 11th attacks, and you may have run into this when you worked out too. My group that I was working out with wanted to do the whole 110 flights of stairs uh, workout, so we actually split it up in groups of two, but we had the 40 pound sack on our back like a firefighter, and we, uh, we split it up and went, went the 110 flights of stairs in teams of two now. Uh, guy who was working out with us named Judson shared on Wednesday morning one of his friends who worked in the Twin Towers and was there on September 11, 2001 when the attacks hit. He ran down the flights of steps and he had two visions that are seared in his mind and his memory forever, this friend said. The first was this, the vision of as he finally made it down the last flight of steps and went through the building and out that door into the outside, he was amazed at the freedom. He knew by that point with all the smoke, the building wasn't coming down yet, but he knew he was in a death trap. And he was amazed to see the outside once again. He wasn't taking that for granted at all. He was amazed by that, number one, but secondly, he said what was more amazing than that sight of his freedom, of running out of the death trap, was the sight of the faces and the eyes of the first responders who were running in as he ran out. A lot of firefighters, New York firefighters, EMTs, police. He said their faces were focused and resolute. You know, they came running and coming from all over the city to get to those buildings. And Judson's friend said, their faces were resolute and I could see in their eyes. I knew and they knew. Most of them would never leave that place alive. They were gonna die in the next few minutes or next few hours as life savers for other people. You know, they say that in the early decades and centuries of the Christian church, when we were a persecuted minority, one thing that stood out was that when plagues hit and when crises hit, the Christians were the ones running in to the fire, running in to help people who were stricken with the plague, not worried about themselves, not holding up or saying, I don't want to have anything to do with you. Christians were willing to give their lives away for the salvation of others. You know, Christians went and saved babies who had been put out to die in the Roman system and adopted these children. Christians follow this. But back to the first responders story, what makes the difference with them? And let me pause and be clear on this. Not everybody who's named a first responder responds with resolute clarity at the time of crisis. We can all remember the tragic situation of the Uvalde shooting and the hesitancy and the paralysis of analysis that went on for hours, really, as people were killed. So what makes the difference? What makes the difference in the kind of first responders who actually respond when they need to even give up their own lives, when, when you hit the times that change lives forever? Well, I think part of what we learn is not just clear teaching, because the Uvalde people were all prepped on what was supposed to happen, but clear teaching that flows into consistent training, not just having kind of a gathering every few months and saying, now remember, these are, these are the things we do, but actually consistent day in and day out training and day in and day out core value commitment put into practice every day. And the every other day is kind of just, just another week, just like last week. And then when the crisis hits, it just comes. You know what you do because you do it all the time. And it's going to be a lot worse this time. But this is who you are 
This is your value. This is your practice. This is what you do. You run into the Twin Tower as it's about to collapse. Because you are what you repeat and keep. You are what you repeat and keep. I've been reflecting on those resolute faces. As you can see, I pulled a few of them for you. The follow through of those September 11th folks in the, who acted in the crucible. And it reminds me of what Luke says about Jesus. It's in Luke chapter 9, verse 51. Then it came to pass as the days were being fulfilled for his ascension. In other words, Jesus is going to go through the cross, go through his death, and then ultimately his ascension to the right hand of the Father to advocate for us, for our salvation. He, Jesus, Luke says, set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he kept his face set there as the authorities turned against him, as it was obvious he was going to die in Jerusalem. He already knows it, but it becomes just palpably obvious with the, with the responses of the religious leaders and the political parties. And, and thinking about what that means for you and me, because in turn, Jesus says, if anyone wants to come after me, in other words, be my disciple, be one of my people, be on my team, he must deny himself. Deny himself. Did you hear that? And, and then listen to this. Take up his cross. I want you to catch this. Daily. Daily take up his cross. Not just occasionally when it, I have some time for it. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Today, one of my questions for you and me is this. It's a, it's a simple question, but a deep question. Is God getting the me he wants me to be. Is God getting the me he wants me to be? And if you happen to be a, a parent, if you're blessed with being a parent, and you know, it's a great blessing, but also an incredible accountability situation because you're going to be accountable parents before the Lord who's given you these, entrusted these children to you. He asks this question, am I shepherding my children to grow into the disciples the Lord wants them to be? For points of reference, as we look to some scripture today, just give you some highlights as we head into this. Jesus says, my mother and my brothers are those hearing the word of God and doing it. And then he also says this, therefore, pay attention to see how you hear. And finally, he says, blessed rather are those hearing God's word and keeping it. In other words, holding fast to it, guarding it and holding on to it. Now, let's turn to our scripture for today, Luke chapter 8, verses 11 through 21, and then chapter 11, verses 27 and 28. Hear now God's word. Now, Jesus is teaching, applying his parable that he's just told about the seed, the sower, the seed, and the, the soils. Now, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Now, the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. But these have no root, Jesus says. They believe for a while and in a time of testing fall away. And as for, those, as for what fell into the thorns, these are those who hear, but as they make their way, are choked under the cares and riches and pleasures of life. You may have run into some people like that. Choked under the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and they bring forth no fruit to maturity. But that in the good soil. These are those who, Jesus says, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bring forth fruit with perseverance. No one, after lighting a lamp, covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. Therefore, pay attention to see how you hear. Because to the one who has, more will be given. 
and from the one who has not, even what he thinks he has will be taken away. Then his mother and his brothers came to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, your mother and brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered them, my mother and my brothers are those who are hearing the word of God and doing it. And then to Luke 11, 27 and 28, <clears throat> as he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that gave you birth and the breast at which you nursed. He replied, blessed rather are those hearing the word of God and keeping it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. My mother and my brothers are those who are hearing God's word and doing it. You are what you repeat and keep. And the question is, is God getting the you that he wants you to be? Now, I got to tell you, this world entices us and enculturates us to ask a different question. The world leads us to ask this question, am I getting what I want, what I deserve? I mean, I'm not going to this afternoon, but if I were to turn on NFL coverage, I'm sure there'd be all kinds of advertisements telling me that I work really hard, I deserve to have that vehicle and be able to drive up on that mountaintop and swim in that alpine lake and just have the wonderful experience that $100,000 put down on that car would provide for me. And I deserve it because I work that hard and that is the lifestyle that I ought to get. But that's, that's what the world is calling me to, to ask about. Am I getting what I want? But according to the Bible, the real faith question is this, is God getting the me that he wants from me? And for parents, again, am I shepherding my children day in, day out, Lord's day in and Lord's day out, so that they will grow up to be truly disciples of Jesus, who trust and give their lives to him, follow his way, and will reign with him in his eternal kingdom. And here's the deal, parents. What you actually do and the track patterns you set up, that says a whole lot more to your children than what you talk about occasionally. You can have a nice devotional time every three months, but if your rhythms and your practices are different, they know how to read the situation. And they can do that when they're three, much less 13 or 18 or 23. You are what you repeat and keep. Habits, let's talk about habits. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. And let us consider how to spur one another on toward love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as, it the, as is the habit of, of some. See, already in the early church, after a few decades, some of the church members were saying, we don't, we don't need to meet like every Lord's Day. I mean, we got things to do people to see, right? as of the habit of some, see that habit word there? But instead, encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day, that means the day of the Lord, we're all coming to the judgment, right? Drawing near. Now, the word for habit there that's translated as habit is actually the Greek word ethos, which can also be translated as custom. And if you've studied ethics, okay, there it is. It turns out your ethics are basically what you actually do every day, your customs. So let me ask you this, what are your habits? And what habits are you instilling in your children? Because see, here's the reality, what you repeat over and over again, after a while kind of mindlessly, defines who you are and will define how they grow up. On this baptism day, we wanna remember that. It's kind of like a mold. Your habits form you and define you it end up kind of locking you in, and your children also. Theologian Michael Horton says, character is largely a bundle of habits. And here's the reality. This is the way I would put it. Your habits reveal what truly captures your heart. Okay, what you do. Like, I'm, I do this, this is who, this is, you know, what I do defines what is actually capturing my heart and what rules my life. And by extension, if I have children in my household, what rules their lives? 
See, what really shapes your character and marks your true allegiances for yourselves and your children. Blaise Pascal, the 17th century French mathematician and philosopher, Christian, said, proofs only convince the mind. Custom, in other words, what we actually do on a daily basis, on an every week basis, custom is the source of our strongest believed proofs. Because see, you're not gonna wanna have to, you, you can have like a little time where you think about, yeah, I really ought to do that, but what you actually keep doing is your real belief system, and it's gonna govern you. I was interested to hear Dr. John Lennox, the retired professor emeritus of math at Oxford, great Christian speaker. When they asked him, what final words of wisdom would you leave for your children and grandchildren, he said this, our lives rush past. We become fixated on digital equipment that is robbing us of time. We have limited amount of time. He's a mathematician, right? And a Christian. We are robbing ourselves of the most important thing in our lives, seeking fellowship with God through his word and through worship at his feet. A lot of people doing that. Um, because we can so easily nowadays, with all the technology, I mean, Pascal didn't have to deal with this, but now what happens is it kind of doubles down. We've become addicted to digital devices and artificial intelligence pushes culture at us and habits at us. And they, it kind of becomes a vicious cycle. This becomes our habit. It's a lot easier to receive stuff that's pushed at me on my smartphone than it is actually to spend time with God and actually think and pray to God. It's a lot easier to be pushed at. It's even easier to listen to so-called Christian programming than it is actually to spend time reflecting and seeking wisdom from God. Neuroscientists and psychologists tell us that habits emerge because our brain doesn't want to have to work too hard, right? It burns a lot of energy and diverts a lot of attention to have to make big decisions all the time, okay? Like, there are thousands of homes in Starkville. If when I left church every night, I had to think like, wow, there are thousands of homes. I've got thousands of different options. Which home should I go to tonight? Where should I go and make my homestead and my family tonight? That would burn me out really fast, right? We like knowing what we're doing. See, that, but your habit pattern is gonna set you on a course. Duhigg says in The Power of Habit, the brain is wired to make almost any routine you begin to follow into a habit and to lock it in. Because habits allow our minds to ramp down so we don't have to be so stressed. And so we just kind of do the same old, same old. And when I get to it, I'll get to that other thing that you're talking about. We all have habits. The question is, which habits are you practicing? You've heard practice make, makes perfect, right? Well, any good choir director or coach is going to tell you, no, 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 practice does not make perfect. Good practice, right? You need, if, if I'm practicing a bad golf swing over and over again, am I going to win the Masters this coming spring? No way, right? It's, 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 the question is, what are you practicing? The old saying is, it's, it takes perfect practice to make perfect. Well, as Christians, we know there's one person who's perfect, right? and one track pattern that's perfect. It's Jesus and his way. So is my practice leading me and leading my children to follow the perfect person and his perfect way? Especially before I have to go to the crucibles, right? Because they're gonna come. You're gonna have crises in your life. Your children are gonna have crises. And the question is, how are they prepared? And Jesus talks about this reality. He was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered, my mother and my brothers are those who are hearing God's word and doing it. Now, the verb he uses there is a form of the, the Greek verb poeo. And it means to actually like do, put into practice, or could be translated produce. Like God wants production out of us. So Jesus says... I mean, in, in, like John the Baptist said, produce fruit that is keeping with repentance, the same verb. Produce fruit, fruit keeping with repentance. Jesus says uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, every tree that does not bear, in other words, po'eo, 
produce, do, lead to good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Jesus also says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Did you know not everybody who says Lord to Jesus is actually saved and they won't enter the kingdom of heaven? Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does, there it is again, poeo, who actually puts into practice the will of my Father who is in heaven is the one who will be in the kingdom. Because see, are we saved by our works? No. But if we actually are saved, will we work? Will we produce fruit? Yes, absolutely. Jesus guarantees it. Therefore, he says, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, did you hear that? There it is again. Acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So, as he says, as Jesus says, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and actually follow me. And daily. Did you catch that? Daily. Like Eugene Peterson says, Christian faith is actually a long obedience in the same direction. A long obedience in the same direction. Jesus calls it the fruit of perseverance. We don't get diverted, right? We keep the practice and we put it into practice every day. But that in the good soil, these are those who hearing the word whole it fast in an honest and good heart and bring forth fruit with perseverance. So back to our question, is God getting the me he wants me to be? And am I really leading my children to grow up to be the disciples he's calling them to be? So Jesus tells us, look, you gotta pay attention. Pay attention to see how you're hearing. Is the hearing actually ending up leading to fruit? Are you actually practicing this every day? Again, long obedience in the same direction. Daily serious time in God's word and prayer. Worship and fellowship with the Lord's people on the Lord's day. Daily taking up the cross and following Jesus and giving ourselves away sacrificially for Jesus. This leads to the fruit of repentance and the fruit of perseverance. David Mathis puts it this way. Your perseverance under God is in your habits. Heaven and hell hang on habits. Let me repeat that. Heaven and hell hang on habits. Show me a man's habits, and you'll give me a glimpse into his very soul. The habits you develop and sustain today will affect how you persevere in the good times and the hard times. So Jesus says, blessed rather are those hearing the word and keeping it. Back this summer, you know, late July, heading into August, we had the Olympics in Paris, and I was remembering, among others, that, that you know, the centennial anniversary of Eric Little, the great Scott runner, and his Olympic experience in the Paris Olympics in 1924. You may remember the story of Eric Little. You may not know the story of Eric Little. He grew up as a as a son of Christian missionaries, Scott Presbyterian missionaries to China. He came back, did boarding school in England. He went to the University of Edinburgh. He was a devoted Christian. He was devoted and wrote about it to daily spiritual practices, daily Christian scripture reading and prayer, daily fellowship with other Christians. He actually did that daily and definitely a commitment to the Lord on the Lord's day. That was, he was famous for that. He was the greatest um, end or runner on Scotland's national rugby team. For our purposes, he would have been a running back, the best, you know, they had. He was the fastest runner in the United Kingdom. He was arguably on track to win the 100 meters at the 1924 Paris Olympics. But then he ran into an issue. The opening heat to qualify for the 100 meters, the final, was gonna be on a Sunday. And Little was a committed Christian, which meant he, as he understood that, no sports, no nothing except the Lord and worshiping the Lord on the Lord's day. So it caused this furor with the UK, United Kingdom, Great Britain's Olympic Committee, but he refused to run in the qualifying heat at the Olympics. He actually, if you've seen the movie, Sherry of Fire, you would think that happened like right before it. He actually knew several months in advance that there was this conflict and he announced his problem. 
and he was invited to run instead in alternative races, the 200 and the 400. Only he was a 100 meter runner. So what's he gonna do? He starts training for those. And then amazingly what happened at the Olympics is, uh, Harold Abrams, whom Little had already beaten previously, wins the 100 meter gold medal for England, for the United Kingdom. Little runs in the 200, as does Harold Abrams. Uh, Little wins the bronze. Harold Abrams did not medal. And then you come to the 400. There's no way a 100 meter sprinter is gonna win the 400 meters. But Little approached this radically. He decided to run basically two 200 meter dashes. And that's the way he ran the 400. He smashed the world record. He shocked everybody. He was in the outside lane. He was not supposed to do anything. And he won by five meters decisively the 400 meter race, won the gold medal, broke the world record. And you know, when he was getting ready to run, somebody handed him a note. And uh, the note said this, it says in the old book, him that honors me, I will honor, wishing you the best of success always. That old book, of course, was the Bible, and that's a quote from 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30. As the runners lined up for the track, Little did his classic thing of going over and shaking everybody's hand and blessing them and wishing them well. He was an evangelist. And 47 seconds later, he was the gold medalist in the 400 out of nowhere. Is that the end of his story? No, not at all. As you may know, he went on to serve as a missionary in China for over 20 years. He led many people to Christ. Part of the underground church in China now uh, bears a connection with his ministry there. He sent his family, his daughters, and his wife home in the 1930s when Japan was taking over China. He stayed to continue the mission. He was captured by the Japanese several years in a Japanese concentration camp where he died a martyr. And you know what the really cool thing about Eric Little is? Because he loved the Lord so much. Eric Little finished the real race well. He can say with the Apostle Paul, I've run the race. I've kept the faith. Finished the race. And there is in store for me heavenly glory. Jesus guarantees this in Revelation. He says, those who persevere through the trial and are faithful to the end, I will give the crown, the laurel, like the Olympic, you know, wreath of life to live with me forever. And Jesus says, blessed are those who hear the word and are keeping it all the way through. May God get from you the person he calls you to be and from your children the disciples he calls them to be. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.